Hey everybody, it's Greg Rice and we're here in downtown Providence at the Turk's Head building on the 14th floor with John La Rochelle. Good to see you, Greg. Nice to meet you, John, of La Rochelle Law. And John actually was brought to me from a mutual friend. That's right, Mr. Emilio, Emilio Despirito. De Great guy. I had breakfast with Emilio this morning, a business titan who's just growing and growing. How did you meet him? Emilio and I met through a BNI marketing, and I could see that Emilio was a superstar realtor. I was trying to sell this unusual property uh, that I owned with David Caprio. We call it the Beach Mansion in Barrington. 15 bedroom property built in 1895, but with 15 bedrooms, it's tough to market that to the general public. You need a special person. So after being with another realtor for a while, who she did a great job trying to sell this white elephant. Mm -hmm. But when we brought Emilio on board, let me tell you, he just did a fantastic job in marketing, social media, different ideas, price evaluations, doing everything right. And uh, we were very happy that he recently sold it for us. And I'll tell you what, he's such a great salesman that he even brought me in there to check it out. He said, Greg, maybe you'll like this. You're looking for a house on the water? And I was like, wow whole lot of house, too much house for me. Yeah, too much house for me and probably 95% of the people out there. How many square feet was it? You know, it was tough to exactly say because it was this massive basement also. I think ultimately it was like 10,500 square feet. Wow. I don't think that included the, the, the basement though, which I mean you could have like a, a hockey rink in the basement. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so cool, big shout out and a thank you to our good friend Emilio Despirito. So John, let's jump into you though. When did you get involved with law? So I felt like being a lawyer would be a fun job uh, and I thought that it would, it would be interesting in many different aspects and not be something that might otherwise be as boring as some other jobs can be from time to time. So right out of law school I went right into the Rhode Island Department of the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. uh, I interned there when I was in law school and I loved it. I loved my time being with the Attorney General's Department and they had a you know a great lasting effect on me and I said that when I'm finished with that aspect of my career I would like to continue to use the litigation experience I gained, the courtroom uh, experience the entire, I would say, whatever I learned there was able to be transferred to what I can bring to clients now. So it was a tremendous experience and I'm grateful for it. I read those press releases from the U.S. Attorney's Office. Every day I just check in to see what they're prosecuting. And there's such a wide variety of things, especially now it's, you know, it's COVID fraud, it's telemarketing fraud, it's elder fraud, it's all these different things. How many people are working in these offices on a daily basis to, to, to reach out and, and investigate all these things? That's a good question. So there's two different uh, attorney general offices here in Rhode Island. They have first a United States attorney general's office who are probably issuing those press releases. That's and, a yeah, and the United States Attorney General's office, uh, Aaron Weissman is the Attorney General for Rhode Island. And Aaron is such a great person. Uh, I have a close relationship with Aaron because Aaron was there working for Jeffrey Pine when I worked at the Department of the Attorney yeah. General. We became friends in 1994 and have been good friends ever since. Aaron runs a great office over there. He has a lot of Office of the Attorney General veterans working for him who worked at the State Office of the Attorney General for many years, gained a lot of valuable experience, mm. and now they are using that at the federal level as federal prosecutors. Mm. So in that office, there's not that many prosecutors. I'm, I'm probably wrong because I'm just throwing it out, yeah. but it might be something like 20 total line prosecutors there, whereas I imagine that with Peter Narona having the Office of the Attorney General with a massive civil division and also a criminal division, uh, you know, I, I believe they probably have a hundred prosecutors over there, but I could be off, wouldn't be, wouldn't be that surprising if I were off by a pretty large number. How much support staff on top of the prosecutors? 
Because they're not doing all the legwork, right? They're no, they, there's a lot of support staff that's that's necessary in, in both offices. And, you know, you have all not just all the police departments, but you have a lot of administrative people, paralegals, you know, both departments. The support staff is key to, mm -hmm. to their success. And what made you leave the public side of things, if you will, to come private? I'll tell you a personal story. So when I started there, I thought I might do this forever. I liked it so much. I remember being in court, and after a trial or a violation hearing or a bail hearing, I would sit back and think, I can't believe I'm getting paid to do this. This is wow. so fun. This is great and rewarding. Um, I loved it. I had a lot of student loans. and But I had been working at the Department of the Attorney General. I would say it was probably just under three years. Mm -hmm. Oh, never missed a student loan payment. My mother had passed away and left me the smallest house in Cumberland, Rhode Island, <laughs> 774 square feet, I remember. Wow. We had, uh, I have three brothers and sisters. My mom was a factory worker, but she was very frugal, excellent with money. And this like $82,000 house was paid in full when she passed away. So I inherited 25% of this small house where I already had 25% of the purchase price of it just by the nature of the ownership of mm -hmm. it. I said, I'm going to go across the street to the bank and apply for a mortgage. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never missed a loan payment, uh, no credit card debt, and they should, I should easily be approved because what could go wrong? I already own 25% of it. And they turned me down and they said, I'm sorry, with your high student loans and uh -huh. the amount of income you make, even though you have a good credit score, you're not going to qualify. And I thought, if I can't qualify for a 774 square foot home forget about the beach as a prosecutor, mansion. forget about the beach <laughs> mansion, what about if I have a family, what am I going to do? So at the time, a couple of veteran attorneys who I like and respect very much, uh, Billy Murphy and Scott Lutz, had been asking me if I had any interest in going into private practice. And before that meeting at the bank, I told them I didn't have any interest. Hmm. After the meeting, however, Greg, <laughs> hey, I had some interest. <laughs> I went over to Scott Lutz's home and... What year was this? Uh, this was 1997. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I'm from modest means, and I remember coming into this house and thinking, whoa, if I could have a home like this, mm -hmm. the incentive is even higher. It was even beyond my expectations. I thought, wow, this is a beautiful home in Jamestown. He has this beautiful family. And so Scott successfully convinced me to uh, take a risk and work for he and Billy Murphy uh, here in downtown Providence. I had a great time and learned a ton from those two experts. And I did that for one year. And at the end of one year, I said, I exceeded my expectations and said, I'm ready to go out on my own. Wow. So for the folks at home that may not know the difference between the public side, the private side, is it safe to say that the public side, when you're at the attorney's office, attorney general's office, has a budget, and they pay their staff and their attorneys based on the number to meet their budget. But once you go private, you're charging your time. That's exactly you're correct. You're picking your hourly rate, etc. So there's more upswing for you. Yeah, there's a lot of risk too, though, because if you can imagine, if you're not bringing in the clients and you're not bringing in the work, then you're not going to make it. And you have to balance that with your office space, your expenses. Uh, so if you're willing to work very hard and you have that uh, prosecutorial experience mm -hmm. behind you, then you can bring a lot of value to clients. They see that. And as long as you really care about the work and really care about winning um, and doing right by the client, then, you know, I find that most people are going to be successful. And I was fortunate that I used the great advice that Billy Murphy and Scott Lutz provided me with and parlayed it into my own law firm. And uh, so at first, as we say, when you first go out, when you're the prosecutor, you get to wear the white hat. Mm -hmm. But when you leave the prosecutor's office, you could step into a big law firm. Big True. law firms want that experience. True. And in that case, you could do any type of work, especially if you worked in the civil department in the office of the attorney general. You could step in and use that experience directly. 
But if you worked in the criminal department, which I did, then when you come out, there's only one real experience you have, and that is criminal law. Mm -hmm. When you work for the government, you wear the white hat, mm -hmm. and you're prosecuting crimes, and you're defending people charged with crimes um, against complaining witnesses. But when you come out into private sector, sector you have to then pro uh, defend, excuse me, defend people who are accused of crimes and make sure that they get the best defense possible. And no matter you know what you might think of either side, both sides are completely necessary mm -hmm. for a strong foundation with criminal justice. I'm not a person who wants to sentence hardened criminals lightly, but I am a person, and I think you will be too, Greg, anybody who thinks about it is going to say, before we give this person this very long sentence for a terrible crime, let's be certain that he committed that crime. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we talk about, people might say, how can you defend a rapist? Or how can you defend someone who's accused of murder? Not everyone who's accused of it committed that crime. True. And sometimes there are mitigating factors. It doesn't justify what they did in any way. But sometimes there are other factors that you want to take into consideration. And is it more appropriate for someone to serve a 15-year sentence than a life sentence? Sure. And a lot of your job is to find all the evidence, do whatever you can to convince the prosecutor and the judge mm -hmm. that a more fair sentence, given the circumstances, is a 15-year sentence rather than a life sentence. And there are some cases where there's enough weaknesses in the case where you're able to try those cases and, and have a victory. Hmm. So your specialty is criminal defense. Is that what the folks at home should take from this? Oh, I would say this. Thank you for bringing that up. There's, there's, so I'm going to tell you about an experience I had. I'll give you a long-winded answer. Perfect. So I would say that 40% of my practice is criminal defense. Okay. 60% of my practice is family law. And how that happened was a business person, an outstanding attorney who I really respect, David Cooper, also a downtown Providence lawyer. I noticed that David was very successful. I, he has a lot of charisma. Uh, I, I liked the way that he, that he practiced and held himself out in the courtroom. And David and I had uh, struck up a friendship when I first came out. And you know, David had given me some great advice. And he said, you know, John, you, you might be very good doing criminal law, hmm. but the criminal law business may dry up from time to time. You may go through spurts where you're going to want another area of practice mm -hmm. so that it doesn't have to be 100% criminal law. So that's just my opinion that you might consider going into a similar area that's very close to that, but that's not exactly that. And I felt like in family law, you know, in, in criminal law, you're doing jury trials and in family court, your only trial is in front of a judge. And because I had to go in, I had a great experience with Judge DeRobio, a legendary judge. And he would come in and we'd have to have all our cases ready to go, all our witnesses ready to go. And he might start at 9 o'clock and at 9.05 say, Prosecutor, you ready on this case? No, I'm going to dismiss it. If you're ready, call your first witness. Let's go. Let's have it. No nonsense. Dismiss it, huh? Yeah, you're not ready to go? This violation hearing is dismissed. Uh, well, you're not ready to go? I'm setting bail. So he made all the prosecutors be ready to go yeah. on their toes, have all their witnesses ready. He also did the same thing for the defendants. You know, oh, I have a witness who's not here. Today's your day. Today's a violation hearing. You'll get a chance at your trial, but today is only your violation hearing. So today, today's your day to mm -hmm. go forward. So he made people go forward. Um, I have a funny war story. So I remember occasionally you'll get these big name lawyers who are TV lawyers who don't have much real courtroom experience, mm -hmm. but they're excellent marketers. My hat is off to them for being Highway excellent. lawyers, I yeah, call Yeah, well, they're, they're excellent at marketing. They are excellent <laughs> at building big machines. And one of them from Southeast Massachusetts, who I won't name, but I'm sure most viewers would know the name, he came in and... Uh, uh, my uh, a prosecutor and I were covering uh, that courtroom, courtroom 4D, Judge Derobio. And he walked in full of bluster and he presented his entry of appearance before the judge and he said, Judge Derobio, 
First name, last name, on behalf of the defendant, I'm entering my appearance today. I've requested discovery from the prosecutor, and I'm requesting from you a two-week continuance. And he turned to the prosecutor, and he said, Mr. Mactaz, call your first witness. Wow. So when you're used to working under that pressure and having to be that prepared and that ready to go and mm -hmm. thinking on your feet and ready to go uh, in for any type of criminal case that comes before you, I saw that that would translate directly into family court. Mm -hmm. In family court, it seemed like it was, frankly, much easier. A lot of other family court practitioners didn't have the trial experience, didn't have the courtroom experience. So when I went in, immediately I was able to provide value to clients because I was familiar with the court process. I could think of my feet. If we wanted to have, my theory was always, I don't want to continue a family court case, we're here in court. Mm -hmm. The Derobio theory, we're going to be prepared, we're going to go in, and we're going to have the hearing. And if the other side doesn't want to have the hearing, that's great. They can come to, mm -hmm. they can come to the negotiating table and accept our terms, or let's have the hearing. We're here, we're here to have the hearing. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. And that became so effective that that advantage was greater than it was going against veteran prosecutors in other in the criminal setting. So eventually my practice became more and more focused on family court and doing family court work. I will say, however, that when I was a prosecutor, I did all of the state police drunk driving cases for the County of Providence for a period of time. Most other prosecutors, they weren't that excited about doing the drunk driving cases because they required a lot more preparation work. Instead of a domestic violence case where it was a he said, she said, and you only had to have the complaining witness come in and she would give her side of the story, in a drunk driving case, you had to bring in the Department of Health and make sure that the intoxilizer was certified, make sure that the breathalyzer operator was certified, make sure that the officers were skilled and experienced in doing the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration protocols. Mm. Back at that time, we would have officers who would do, let's say, the finger test where they would mm -hmm. do the finger tip to thumb test. But if someone had nerve damage or some other injury that prevented them from doing that, you could throw that test out. Mm. Others did the alphabet backwards test. But what if you were dyslexic? What if English wasn't your first language? I can't even do the alphabet <laughs> I wouldn't want to have to do it right now on camera. <laughs> so there are many different ways where I prepared those cases intensely. And thinking in law school that I might want to be a prosecutor, I took an entire semester just on drunk driving, hmm. just on the cases. So when I was at the Department of the Attorney General, I tried to focus every hour I could taking as many drunk driving cases as possible. So. Now that I tell you 60% of the family court practice is there, I also still very much enjoy doing a lot of not just drunk driving cases, but any alcohol-related driving offense. I recently took in a case where, unfortunately, a young woman who was 19 years old was the passenger in a car in Newport uh, earlier this month where, uh, unfortunately, she was tragically killed. She didn't have a seatbelt, and the car hit a pole and the, the, the man and his family retained myself and uh, the person with whom I often partner up, attorney John MacDonald, and together we're representing them in that. So I feel like I can bring an especially high value to a client who's looking for an alcohol-related driving accident, alcohol-related, uh, any alcohol-related crime that involves a motor vehicle. Hmm. And how do you remove the emotion? How do you keep yourself grounded, balanced, so when you go home to your wife and kids, you're you, and you're not distressed, and you're not beat up about what you just learned and what you just heard on the phone? I would say, Greg, that that's probably the toughest aspect of the practice, and I feel like part of what sets me above other people, other practitioners, is I really do care a lot. I'm very competitive, and I want to win. I also am compassionate and really strike up friendships with, with many of my clients where I really want to do right by them. And it's tough when they're going through the most difficult times in their life. Um, I represented a person who was one week away from going into a police academy and 
his his best friend, they were out drinking, celebrating it, and they were in Narragansett. Now, his best friend was more drunk than him, so he decided to drive the best friend's car, and the best friend wanted it to happen too, and he got into an accident and killed his best friend. It's tough to want the best for that person, to, to try to make it so that person doesn't do a day in jail, mm -hmm. try to work hard to get the best result possible and not take some of that home with you. Or perhaps you have a situation where I do a lot of restraining order cases where someone might go to the court and they give their side of the story and which is the necessary way the process has to happen. I'm not, I'm not begrudging the process. But if you were to go in today uh, as a you know, regular professional man, Greg, and write out an affidavit saying, this is what my wife did to me, this is some evidence I have of it, they're probably going to issue a restraining order if it looks like what you're saying yeah. is truthful and you don't have a criminal history and you're a business person and, and you what you wrote was backed by some form of evidence, even if it was small, then what's going to happen is the court is going to initially take a precaution and say, okay, well, Stay your away. wife, you're out of the house. Greg's in the house now with the kids. So oftentimes people come to me with restraining order situations where they say, I was served. I can't go back to my home. I have nowhere else to go. How, my, I can't. My kids are gonna think I did something wrong. I didn't do anything wrong. So when I'm fighting for that person, it is difficult mm. to separate yourself. It's difficult not to bring it home. Um, I'm still struggling with that, but I feel like with every passing year, it gets a little bit easier to say you can be a great attorney to those people and just do your best that when you get home just to turn it off, not think about it, focus being present in the moment with my family, and then when I wake up early the next day, I can resume worrying about all my clients' uh, issues. If you're like me, you're constantly checking those emails. I gotta tell you, that... Uh, That's, and then you're like, oh, let me just see what's going on, and then you see one, and you're like, all right, let me act on it, oh, oh now I gotta do this, and let me call him, and it just, it's spider webs. You, you, so you gotta like, Shut the damn thing off. And that's that's basically what it is. And and I feel like being a person who um, focuses his practice in family law and in criminal defense, you're getting people who might call you at 8 o'clock at night right. with, they, they need your help right now. Mm -hmm. Or it might be Sunday. And this woman who's paying me a lot of money, I'm yeah. just saying this woman, it could be anybody, you know, it happens with men and women, but I'm just giving you a, a, a hypothetical example. And I've said to her, okay, listen, your, your um, ex-husband has brought the kids back two hours late, two weeks in a row. I, you know, let's just wait until it's really an emergency. If he does it a third time, I've, I've, I've notified his lawyer in writing, we're going to court the next day, we're going to make it happen. Now, if they're supposed to be there at four, and she calls me at seven and says, they're not back yet, John. What are we going to do? This is the third week in a row, or maybe it's not the third week in a row, but it's the third time in five weeks. You said you'd do something. I have to respond, like a yeah. firefighter. There's, yeah. not, I have to, there's a fire going that. on. I can't leave that. I can't just do that. So my family is very understanding about that, and I just try to do my best to, as you said, put the phone down for an hour. Focus on them. Focus like that. Check it. Oh, is there an emergency? Is there something going on? No, there's something we can do tomorrow. Put the phone down for another hour. Do things like that. Make it so that even though it might not seem like a lot, you know, when you're focused with them, at least for that time I'm with them, it's exclusively their time. Their time. But I could check. Hey, they know that sometimes it happens. I have two young children. I live in a, uh, a loft in downtown Providence. The only place that I can have complete privacy is in the walk-in closet. <laughs> so that means I lock the bedroom door, yeah, I lock the, uh, um, the walk-in closet, go in there with the iPad, put on the uh, Bose over the ears noise-canceling headphones, mm -hmm. and now I have a completely confidential conversation and take care of business. And sometimes that might have to happen at yeah. Sunday afternoon at 3, sometimes it might have to happen Tuesday night at 7 p.m., but my family's very understanding about that. And then when I come out, Okay, I'm um, theirs again. You come out Uninterrupted. Of the <laughs> well said. <laughs> I teach classes at the ACI, job readiness. So I go in there every week, and 20 inmates get to see and hear from me as a business person on how to get a career, how to maintain it, how to grow it. 
So with that, I get to learn their stories. And I've learned, and my opinion is, they committed their crimes because of bad data. They, growing up, were given some type of information. You know, do this, you get that, or have this, you'll have that. And they did those things and ended up there. So that's my opinion. People commit crimes because of bad information, bad data. Why do you think people commit crimes? I've never heard it like that, but you said it excellently. And while I'm not a person to say, you know, everything is determined from the moment you're born, the environment in which you grew up makes a huge difference. Um, you know, I remember where I, I, there was this guy who was like his third domestic. I think he broke a, a mirror over like the woman's head or something like that. It's, it's bad, bad situation. Um, but, you know, I'm passionate, I get animated, you know, and I was, you know, whatever, whatever the situation was, it was a violation hearing, and, um, I feel like, I think I lost that violation hearing, the evidence wasn't there, I think the woman had, mm. had made it up, and, you know, he was released, he had two priors, but this time, this person wasn't done, and he didn't do it, and, you know, he came up to me afterwards and said, I'm not making any excuses, I just want you to know that you think I'm this terrible person, and he said a similar thing. He said, if you knew how my parents punished me or what my parents did to me, mm. um, you know, you know, you might understand why at times I'm, I'm more violent than the next person. I do mm. something. I'm not justifying it. But he said, my parents would make me eat cat food for dinner as a punishment. Right. Um, he said, if you go through that growing up, you know, your, your, your reactions and your, your thoughts can, can go off the rails. Yeah. And I thought, you know, doesn't excuse right. two priors, doesn't make it right. But it, there's, listen, there's a full story behind every person who's incarcerated. And how do you trim the fat on the stories? Because I'm sure you get stories all the time, or even when you're on the other side, you get stories. How do you kind of condense it so that you're not wasting time and going down these rabbit holes and, and getting to the meat and potatoes? Yeah, you're, you're, you'd be a great attorney. I would say that, that that's what you have to do because you only have that short period of time. It's almost like... In a way, you hear elevator pitch. Well, the court has so many different cases every day. I mean, if they could sit here and, and, and I could speak to them <laughs> in, in this uh, long format, then I feel like you know justice would probably be better served if myself and the opposing counsel were able to do this. Instead, you have a very short window of time to make your case. And if you can't make your case, then you can either go to a hearing or that's it, the judge is going to make a decision. So you're right, well, you have to call the most important aspect of the case. And sometimes it's only two different aspects right. where a, a person uh, recently had done something where they were accused of deliberately giving a child um, a medication that wasn't the child's without revealing anything and without breaching any confidentiality. I pulled from that the three most uh, telling reasons why somebody might have thought that when it didn't happen mm -hmm. and was able to go and get some evidence to support that that did not happen. I feel like if you're going beyond those three reasons, there might be 10 different ancillary reasons why it, it, it may not have happened. It probably didn't happen. Mm -hmm. But if you can hit the main three and you have evidence to support it, that's the biggest part of it. You might have four and five might be strong too but four and five they don't have any documentation there's no proof of it and you know if you can bring in a prescription that shows hey no pill like that was in the house since right. april it's now november nothing's been in the house since that time or you could bring in some evidence in that way we do the same protocol i take them out of lock boxes i keep the prescriptions right. in separate lock boxes here's photographs of the lock boxes i have the receipts to show you that i've had it so those types of things, while it can't prove it didn't happen, you're backing it up, not just with an argument, but judge, here's this written evidence, here's this evidence from a doctor. So John, do you think that the justice system, the process, is inefficient? I do not think it's inefficient. I, I, I really think it's an excellent system. It's imperfect, it's at times unfair, but given the totality of the circumstances, it's the best possible system out there. It doesn't mean it can't be improved upon. And I feel like with DNA evidence 
and, a tr and, and, and fairer sentencing and removing some mandatory minimums for harsh crimes and improvements like that going forward, we're going to make the system better and better. But I do feel like of all the systems in the world, ours is a fair system. Really? I do. That doesn't mean that people aren't wrongfully incarcerated. That doesn't mean that people sometimes lose custody of their kids, and they shouldn't. I'm not defending any of that. But I feel like in our system of justice, at least everyone has an opportunity to have an experienced advocate present facts, uh, have a trial, you know, ha have every critical fact be considered by a, either a judge or a jury in making the decision. So I don't think it's unfair, but I would say that I'm sure there are some people who didn't get a fair result and they have reason to believe right. it's unfair. My question to them is, what's your alternative proposal? What system or element of the system would you change mm -hmm. in order to make it more fair? And I feel like people have given good suggestions and those things have happened and they are happening. But I, I wouldn't say it's systematically unfair or that the process is unfair but I would say that it should we should look to continue to improve upon it as as we certainly have especially I feel like in the last 20 years and more so especially in the last 10 years we've made great strides for fairness to all even though it doesn't mean it's been fair to everyone but I feel it's getting fairer and fairer and we're reaching goals at everyone or 95% of the people would think are laudable goals for fairness and for making sure the right thing happens in a family court setting and in a criminal context. Hmm. A, a good example on a, a driving while intoxicated charge is a person who comes into the court, is a family of three, never been in trouble before in his life, he's 50 years old, he's the sole supporter of the family, and when he comes to court, before, he would lose his license automatically, no excuses, nothing, if he was convicted of that driving while intoxicated. Now, you might be able to show he shouldn't get that conviction. There's something wrong. You might win or you might be able to negotiate something. But m many people, most people who came before the court for a DUI, they would be convicted. The police got better and better and better about being familiar and uh, prosecute them ver prosecuting them very efficiently. Mm -hmm. Now this person, who might have a great job, but a 45 minute commute to work, that's what happens. He hires a driver every day. You know, you live in Gloucester, you live in Portsmouth, and you work in Providence. Right. Um, many people can't afford to hire a yeah. driver. Um, you could use Uber, I'm not saying it's, you know, those things have made things better, but the state of Rhode Island wisely said, you know, given the right circumstances, in certain situations, when someone meets all of the different criteria, we're going to give him a license where he can operate. Just to work. Just to work. That's Fair it. Fair enough. Fair enough. And we might even give him an extra month or some other. We might give him an extra two months. Hmm. Make him blow into an ignition interlock device. Now we know he's sober. Hmm. We're sure of it. So the state of Rhode Island is making sure that the roads are safe from a person like that. Yep. If it was a one-off night, and the person is not going to do something like this again, then having his license suspended but being able to mm -hmm. drive with an ignition interlock device for that time, it's good for him. Great compromise. Good for the state. Great compromise. Great improvement on the justice system. And there are many of those things, I feel, happening, even though the process is slow and it's frustrating for those who are the victims of the unfairness of it, but I feel like strides are being made just like they are probably in the prison system as well. You know, mm -hmm. I feel like probably, you know, 30 years ago, it was a lot worse. But people yeah. have brought those matters to light, even though, you know, the prison population doesn't have the sympathy of the general public. When the general public heard of some of the outrageous conditions that some inmates were facing, they say, hey, listen, this guy did a bad thing, and he's mm -hmm. in there for 10 years, and he deserves all the 10 years. But while he's in there, we got to make sure that he's not being raped. We right. have to make sure that he's not being deprived of medical care. We right. have to make sure that if he wants an education or he wants to better himself or herself, that that person has an opportunity to do that. I saw that the ACI is operating at 51% capacity, which is the lowest percentage in 
probably ever. Do you think that's because maybe the state wants to save money on the cost of, you know, it's about a thousand bucks a week to house an inmate, or is it more of they've made compromises where you can stay out of prison in exchange for things like you said, you got to do a breathalyzer, you got to check in here, you got to meet your PO here. Like, is there an incentive to get out of the prison system? Absolutely, and I feel like something like the drug court was another incentive, or another change that has developed in the last 20 years, where really, I think most people would say, we should be locking people up for drug use, drug possession, even really minor drug mm -hmm. sales. I agree. And you're taking people who really have these problems that if you were able to solve that, that problem, they might be, have a perfect life. Right. They might be, you know, they might they might decide that um, they're going to be a tremendous community person or just a productive member of society. If you just remove that one that, thing, that one thing mm -hmm. and if you're addicted to drugs or alcohol, it's really that's tough, you know, to hold down any aspect of your life productively. If you just remove that one thing, then you're not just taking that person out of the system you're making them a contributing member of society. So I feel like drug court did that, that took people out of the prison system. Peter Narona recently proposed, or at least discussed, having things like having uh, possession of a small amount of cocaine. Instead of that being a felony conviction, maybe that should be a misdemeanor conviction. Do we really want to brand somebody as a convicted felon if they're caught with a small amount of cocaine and they're you know, 35 years old, they've never been in trouble before in their life, and now they're going to be a convicted felon and not have that taken off their record. So I think with excellent programs like diversion in the, in the drug court, we're keeping people out of prison. So I feel like improvements like that are something that not just helps society, but reduce the burden on the Department of Corrections. Hmm. And the taxpayers. And the taxpayers, importantly, for sure. How about, you know, being a defense attorney... Have any of your, um, I don't know if you call them a client, is that what you call sure, them? Sure, yeah, clients yes, client, yes. Ever physically hit you and said, John, or at the courthouse they attacked you, have you ever been assaulted for, a, a, you know, getting a decision that they didn't like? Thankfully, that has never happened to me, and I feel as though you do see that on TV sometimes, and for sure it makes for, yeah. you know, entertaining uh, television and it's a dangerous situation. And I'm not saying that that couldn't happen to me or to anybody. I mean, there are people in the family court as well who are so angry at the opposing attorney that they think the opposing attorney yeah. is ruining you know, their life, that there's violence against people in that regard too. I feel like with my own clients, I just do my best to really be genuine with them, to if I tell them I'm going to do something, to do it. And if I can't do it, tell them, I can't do it by that time. Transparency. You know? Transparency. I, I think one of the best answers I can give to a question, what's the, what's the answer to this question? I don't always know the answer. I'll say, I don't know the answer to the question, but give me three days, call me back in three days, and in three days I'm going to have a detailed answer to the question. Cl how can clients not say, this guy's a, not just a good attorney, this guy's a good guy. I feel like clients like that, they're not interested in attacking you right. or, or coming yeah, after you. They they're like, this that. guy's been transparent, and he's done everything he said. If I say to somebody a common complaint that you, you may know just being exposed to a lot of inmates is a lawyer will say, I'll be able to see you this week, okay? The week goes by, nothing happens. The next week goes by, nothing happens. The next week goes by, now either their family, they're calling the office, the lawyer, get out here, what are you doing? The lawyer's not returning the call, there's some uncomfortable situation. You know, with me, I'm, I will never tell an inmate, I'll be out to see you this week and not get out there this week. Right. I might say, I think I'm going to get out there this week. And if I don't get out there this week, I'll definitely be out there next week. I'll do my best this week, if I can't do it, you'll see me next week. I'm not going to break that promise. I know that they're waiting for that. I know that I'm their lifeline, right. and i got to make sure that I fulfill that promise. So if I think it's most likely today's a Monday, if I think I can get out there tomorrow or Wednesday, I'm going to say I'm nearly certain I'm going to see you by the end of the week. I think it's going to be tomorrow or Wednesday, but if it can't be, at least I've said I'm nearly yep. certain it's going to be the end of the week, and it's easy to promise, and if that doesn't happen... 
now for sure it's the following week. And they feel I, good about you now. Exactly right. You build trust with them. They say, hey, you know what? This guy, every time he said something, he he's done. done it. And isn't it better too to... It's so easy for a, a prospective client to be sitting in a lawyer's office and the lawyer says, you don't have anything to worry about. I guarantee I'll do this or I guarantee that. Or I, I'm telling you, in your case, you're not going to do jail. You're not going to do jail. Now, I wouldn't want to be the person making that promise unless, you know, I was so sure. Yeah. I tell people, you hear a promise like that, that's great. I'm glad you got it. Get it in writing. Yep. Just have them sign it in writing. There's nothing formal. I guarantee no jail. Sign it, date it, give me that piece of paper. <laughs> Where is it? Where is it? I feel like you're doing people a great disservice. But if you tell a person, I can't guarantee the result, but I can treat you. I can guarantee I will treat you like you're my brother or my sister or my cousin. I'll treat you with that amount of passion, respect, dedication to your case. I can't guarantee any result. Right. But I can guarantee when the research has to be done, I have the most expensive research engine that I pay for, and I have two monitors and a computer and a nice office, and I'm happy to be here doing long yeah. hours of research. I'm happy to do that. If I'm not sure of the answer, I'm going to find out the answer. I don't know what your result is going to be, but I know that I'm going to bring the best possible defense to you. You can, you can count on that. I feel like when someone receives an answer like that and then you follow through with it, no matter what the result, they love you. They can be frustrated, yep. they can be angry, but they generally don't hate the attorney that does that. Right. The other attorney who says, don't worry about it. I know the prosecutor or, you know, oh, you know, this is something I can take care of this for you. Nothing to worry about. You know, pay me this small amount of money and I'll take care of it. The problem is when they get that small amount of money, they don't want to do the work because they have a hundred people giving them that small amount of money just to get the clients. Yeah. But now they've taken the small money. They can't service the hundred clients. They can't do, what if there's a great issue in this case? Right. But the issue is going to require four hours of work. If he does four hours of work, on this guy's case before the first pretrial, there's not going to be, you know, he, right. he's not going to sleep for three days if he right. does that for 100 people. So when an attorney comes in and a client gets that attorney and the guarantee was, don't worry about it, you're not going to lose your license. Don't worry about it, you're not going to jail. And then they lose their license or they go to jail. Mm. I'm not saying I condone any type of violence, right. but you can understand how that person Where says... That comes from. You've ruined my life. Yep. It, it, you know, I, I, I just wanted an honest answer. You lied to me with your guarantee. And, and took then, my money. And took my money. And maybe didn't do the work. Maybe, you know, right. I mean, there's a lot of injustices that could have happened. And I feel like that's why attorneys get a bad reputation. Because people come to them when they're very vulnerable. True. They're going to lose their kids. They're going to lose their liberty. Right. They're going to lose their license. They have to be in court in two days. Right. They're sitting before you. If you're a great salesperson, you, you can, can probably it. sell them, yeah. right? But are you going to do the work? Are you going right. to do the research? Are you going to do whatever it takes to bring the best possible representation? Unfortunately, that comes at a price. Yeah. And that's what people sometimes don't understand. And the guy who gives the low ball price, he gets them in the door. And yeah. a lot of times that guy's an excellent salesperson. You know, that guy would be excellent at doing any types of sales. But, not always, but oftentimes the excellent salespeople aren't the same people who kind of enjoy doing the reading right. and the research and the learning. Right. Um, different, different skill sets. Just like there's not a lot of engineers who are salespeople. Right. So if you think about it, the people who are writing legal briefs and doing the research, a lot of times they don't have the same level of salesmanship as an excellent talker, you know, mm -hmm. the silver tongue might have to bring that client in. So oftentimes clients understandably think, wow, this person's so good at talking to me, he must be good at talking to the prosecutor or the judge, so I'm going to go with him. Not realizing that if that person doesn't have the experience or the willingness to do the work or access to the expensive legal research right. that needs to be done online, you know, then all that silver tongue, we, you know, as a yeah. prosecutor, I can tell you, we've heard it all before. The judge has heard it. We need the evidence. We need right. a law. We need a compelling argument. Mm -hmm. We don't need someone who's just going to come in and say, oh, come on, a guy, a good guy. He's yeah. never been in trouble before. Well, so that's what most okay. people are. Okay, now what's next? Well, that's it. So let me ask you this. How often do attorneys get disbarred in Rhode Island? 
You know, it's a great question, and I, I'm trying to think of a, a recent person I asked that to, and I said, I think I asked, was the number, I, I, I said a really high number. What, what do you think the number is per year? Don't even know. I was, how many are there? That's a great person, too. I mean, but my bar number is in the 5,000s, but obviously the first, like, 1,500 probably aren't around anymore, you know, so not, not, yeah, a lot of them retired, so maybe but now they're up to like 10,000, right, so maybe there's, maybe, and there are probably people, there are people in Massive, you know, I'm going to say, let's just call it maybe 10,000. I would say less than 50 per year. Greg, I used the same number, I said, I said, are there 50 people who get, 50 attorneys who get disbarred every year, and the person in the know said to me, it's more than 50. Wow. Yeah, and I said, it's more than 50? More than 50 years? More than 50 years? So you're looking at 1, 2, 3 percent of the herd is getting... Fewer, fewer than that, you know, out of, let's say, 10,000, let's say 8,000, you know, it's only 50. But still, 50 people who went to law, who, who did seven years of school after high school, at least spent a, probably a good amount of time studying for the bar yeah. exam, got their license, did all the requirements, background checks, everything else like that. And then threw it away. I mean, it's a lot a to throw lot. away. I mean, I see realtors lose their license, which sure. is, that's easy come, easy go, because right. they don't have the training, the experience. Right. But for that many attorneys to lose their... Right, for their eight-year investment. Wow. You know, not quite as much as a, as what a position. What are they doing to, to lose that? I mean... They're, I, honestly, they're doing some bad things. I mean, you you're, not, it's, you're, it's not, you're not you're losing your license for, for unintentional oh, negligence. Intentional. It's recklessness, okay. or, or maybe multiple recklessness situations. So um, they give you a good leash to. Yeah, they're making sure. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna. There's increments of things that you know you could get censured in some way. You could get, you know, there's different punishments they can enact. They could suspend you for a period of time. You know, they could say, um, you know, we're we're going to suspend your license for That's ninety days, time. or you know, you can't practice law for ninety days, or maybe you have to take an ethics class about something but there are lawyers um a lot of it not and i don't pretend to know i mean i'm guessing yeah. a little bit but yeah. my my estimation is it's in the real estate sphere because now you might have a million dollars in your escrow account ah. a lot of real estate transactions so you're you're mm -hmm. holding on to over a million dollars well if you're not a good business person and maybe your rent is due you think geez you know what it's a million. I only owe a thousand. I'll take a thousand out and I'll put it back next week. I'm not stealing it. I, I, I'm, you know, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. And I feel mm. like a lot of times that's the situation that arises. Mm. Or they might have um, a drug issue um, or other type of personal issues where, you know, they say, I'm going to borrow this money. I'm going to borrow this money from the escrow account. Mm -hmm. And then some one day happens and it doesn't get paid back. Next thing you know, there's a shortage. A client says, well, what happened? You know, I had a hundred thousand with you. Where is it? It's gone. You're getting disbarred. Got it. And you should be disbarred. Yeah. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Those could have been my closing proceeds. Could, exactly. Could have been your life savings. Correct. Hundred percent. You're getting disbarred for that. Appropriately so. Hmm. There are some lawyers, you know, who who might commit a serious felony, and if they're discovered, you know, they're getting disbarred then as well. Um, and they be prosecuted too on top. Oh yeah, of that. absolutely, sure, yes, yep. So, you know, before the bar association is going to disbar somebody, it's going to be for something pretty serious. They they want attorneys to provide great yeah. services to the public, and yeah. sometimes if someone if someone could have an alcohol issue yeah. and be negligent and have missed deadlines yeah. or not responded to. Um, a, a client's complaint. The client, you might have, someone might have missed the statute of limitations in a personal injury case. Now the client's barred from bringing that case forever. Mm -hmm. It's not that they're going to disbar somebody over that, but what if the client wrote to the attorney three times and called the office ten times and never got a call back? Well, now the bar association is yeah. going to say, it isn't, you didn't just fail to miss a deadline. You're really wronging this client. Right. You're really wronging them, and you're not addressing it. And there are some lawyers who, when the bar association sends them a letter to say, "Hey, respond right away in writing and tell us what's going on," they don't respond to the to bar them. association. So <laughs> when you have situations <laughs> like that, you know, yeah, you can see. I mean, that's a see you later, right? At least wow. for some period of time, um, as it should be, mm -hmm. right? They're not looking to punish excusable negligence. Right. Even 
you know, even if they feel they can, yeah, or... even if it's sort of something, oh, this guy's got an alcohol issue, this guy's got a drug issue, let's get them back on the road. Let's 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 put them on the path to right. Let's help them out as long as they're not, you know, stealing from the clients, committing felonies, or ignoring clients, or you know, doing things like that. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So my last question. I know you're a busy guy here. I want to talk about this green lamp behind us. Yeah, I quite a story about that lamp. So when I wanted to have a unique lamp that wasn't just, let's say, purchased off Amazon, nothing wrong with Amazon. Yeah. I feel like um, I'm concerned if my, about my wife's well-being if I get home there's not an Amazon package in the, <laughs> on the <laughs> box. <laughs> right, exactly. But I really like the uniqueness of some of the furniture, like this wooden filing cabinet, yep. and this lamp is a good example of that. So I went on eBay and I started to look at antique lamps, and this is a... Uh, slag glass antique lamp that was it's uh, about a hundred or over a hundred years old um, I think it looks more unique and more artistic today than than a modern-day lamp yeah. um, it's it, it's it's a great find and it was severely damaged in shipping and the the, the architect from whom I purchased it in Manhattan you know we had corresponded he said, this lamp is so much, this is like an heirloom, you know, this is, I, I've had this for so long, I, I'm, I'm selling it to you. Um, I mean, you're giving me a fair price, but I'm selling it to you because I, I want someone who's really going to cherish this yeah. unique, uh, beautiful piece of artwork. I said, that is me. It's going to, this is the main lamp in the office. Every client that's going to walk in, yep. it's going to be, you know, first thing they see. And I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to treat it with the respect it deserves. When I opened up the packaging, Greg... I thought to myself, I think, I, I don't know where this guy packaged it. It was beyond anything I had imagined. I thought to myself, does, does UPS provide professional packaging services? I mean, works of art can't be packaged this well. It was remarkable. I mean, you know, bubble wrap upon bubble wrap with things taped. It was so secure. I thought, God, this guy, I've never packaged anything like this or seen anything packaged wow. like this in my life. But when I unpackaged it, it's 100 years old, um, you know, wood and glass, and it was damaged. Mm. And uh, I couldn't believe it, but it was damaged. Well, as you're looking at it, so I'm going to give a plug to Jeff Soderberg mm. out of uh, Cape Cod and um, in Portsmouth and, and Newport, Rhode Island. Jeff Soderberg he did a great piece of furniture for me in my home and built from scratch an amazing cherry wood bed that's unduplicatable. And I knew he provided this beautiful piece of art to me 15 years ago. So when this was damaged, I said, Jeff, can, can this be restored? And he was able to restore it for the same price that I paid the person for it and UPS uh, refunded the money because they agreed okay. that they broke it in shipping and that it was more than adequately packaged, and so it worked out great. The same, I it, I ended up having a lamp that is probably structurally more sound <laughs> after the restoration wow. than it was when I first got it. And, and it's all the original pieces. All the original pieces. So everything what original. What was damaged was the glass. Oh, cracks at the top, and that was the important thing. The gla none of the glass was damaged. Oh, thank God. But thank God. But the top supports in three different places were all cracked, so they were no uh -huh. longer together. And frankly, I had them taped together with strong tape. And I said, you know, just to, just to hold it together yeah, until I get a chance to give it to Jeff. And he did a tremendous job. And now I feel like I have this over 100-year-old antique lamp um, that, that's less expensive than these great um, other lamps I have in the office, but that yeah. has more unique character. Absolutely. That's what people would say about me, unique, a unique character. Yeah. And you don't get damaged in shipping. <laughs> Let's hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so I like the green because the the M.O. of attorneys is that green lamp. That's right. The old green library light. The library light. Studying light. The, the gold yes, chain Yes, that's on. right. But this is better. This Much is more unique. Classier. Yes. But they the sometimes call effect. these library lights. But this slag glass was done yeah. in a unique way a hundred years ago. They were able to make that you know, brilliant, unique yeah. color stand out in that cool marbled type of way yep. that um, that's not done today. I, I forget the name of the, the person, it's some, you know, person, but if you ever, you want to see what a, have you heard of a Tiffany lamp? You've heard of the Tiffany heard company? Of Tiffany company, yeah. Yeah, go on eBay 
and check out original Tiffany lamp. Okay. A lamp like that, eBay, original, Tiffany, same time period. This guy's doing similar type of thing. Uh, might be 50,000, 100,000, 300,000 for these Tiffany glass lamps. Now, I'll tell you, this thing, you know, this thing comes in at under 2,000. <laughs> But it's that same uniqueness, and when you look at the artwork from something like a Tiffany one, you can really see yeah. the, the coolness and uniqueness. But those are like museum pieces. Maybe your next office will have a Tiffany lamp. Let's hope, from your <laughs> lips to God's ears. <laughs> and John, if the folks at home want to get in touch with you in your office, how do they do so? Absolutely. You can call me 24-7. You're going to get a response. Uh, my office number is 401 421 Four four zero seven four two one four four zero seven. You can email me jl at larochellelaw dot com. You get in touch with me. Go on the internet. I'm the only La Rochelle Law on the internet. The only John La Rochelle lawyer in New England. And if you Google me and reach out to me, I promise you, you're going to get a response. Love it, and I believe you. Thank you, Greg. Nice to meet you, John. You. Thank you. And if you have any questions for me, throw them in the comments section below. I'll get right back to you. Once again, Greg Rice here at the Turk's Head Building, downtown Providence, 14th floor. Another unique building. Unique Great piece building. Of art. Love this building. And I uh, interviewed Zach Darrow. I think he's down sure. on the sixth Another floor. Sure. Another business titan. Seventh floor. Yes. Not as good of a view, Zach. I'm sorry. Zach's got that way towards the state house, I think. Not a bad view, but you can see the Newport Bridge from John's office. Very so. fortunate to have this. Since I'm spending most of my life in this office, I might as well make it comfortable and with a nice view. Absolutely. So once again, Greg Race from Nexus Property Management, your property managed.